Well, good morning. It is good to see you, and uh, I'm glad that you're here today. I'm Paul Kirsch, the executive pastor here. If you're out in the foyer, come on in and find your spot. Uh, we want to get started here in just a moment, and uh, we've got, uh, we had a large crowd in uh, our community groups today, and let me mention uh, in relation to that, we're kicking off our community groups again for the fall. And if you have been here but maybe have not had a chance to come to one of the community groups, man, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, really encourage you to come. That's where you really meet a lot of folks and get connected to a lot of folks. And so we encourage you to come and be involved in that on Sunday mornings. This coming Wednesday, we are kicking off our Wednesday night activities. And uh, so I want to invite you to come this coming Wednesday night at 530. Uh, we're going to have hot dogs and chips and drinks and all that kinds of stuff. Uh, as we kick off our Wednesday night stuff, all the kids have, Jimmy and Marwin have planned lots of stuff for our students and for our children, and so they're going to be involved in a lot of things that evening, and all us adults, we're just going to get to fellowship together, all right? So man, come and spend some time with us. Uh, we look forward to our Wednesday nights getting back going, and then after that, following this coming Wednesday night, we'll go back to our normal Bible study routines, and, and I really encourage you to come and be involved in that. So hope that uh, you've had a great Great week, first week of school, right? And I hope that everybody had a great week as they got started back in some of their routines. But we're glad you're here, and we hope that Sunday morning will be a great routine for you and be a part of us each week. If you're a guest here with us, we're so glad that you're here, and it's my privilege to welcome you and hope that you have a great Sunday with us and a great time of worship. Let's pray together, and then we'll move right into our time of worship, all right? Father, we thank you for the day that you have blessed us with. It truly is your day, and we can rejoice and be glad in it. God, I pray that we will experience you this morning in maybe a way we never have. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we'd be very open to you and what you want to do and how you want to do it. Father, we give you all the glory and all the praise because you deserve it and so much more than what we give. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, good morning. I'm so glad to see you, my church. Is everybody good today? Yeah, okay, we got a few really good over here. Um, if you're able and willing to stand, I'd love to invite you to stand. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. It's our privilege and our honor to get to do this. Such great words. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it arise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it arise. Let praise
gathered in my name there I am among them he is here with us just as the Spirit of God was hovering over the water in Genesis 1 1 and he said let there be light Holy Spirit I pray today would you say it again let there be light in our hearts and in our minds illuminate us today Lord to the truth of your word and to you Holy Spirit who wants to speak to us let our hearts be vulnerable in your hands and our minds be open to you. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us.
him, church. Holy, come rest on us. You're all we want. Ask him again. You're all we want. Oh, Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. I need you. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Come down. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. Let me hear you ask him. You're all we want. One more time. with me. I'll think of these words with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Where the whole earth sing these words.
Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Pray with me. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you today thankful for both the triumphs and trials we go through as your disciples. Be with us today as we worship together and be with us this week as we serve you. Help us to be good witnesses for all in all we do. We ask that our actions each and every day show your love and bring others closer to you. In your son Jesus Christ's name we pray.
Go into all the world, teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son. Teach them to observe what I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you. Jesus, that you never leave us nor forsake us. You've called us to this great commission, and you're with us every step of the way. May our lives be a light. May they show off the gospel, your good news, your good love, your faithfulness, your loyalty, your consistency to us. Thank you that you never leave us. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you that we got to worship you this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. You guys be seated. Let's continue to worship. Amen? We continue to worship by studying God's word. Before we jump in, uh, I guess let me tell you this. You can take out your message notes from inside your bulletin. It says thread at the top. And then if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 16 this morning. We'll have all the scripture on the screens behind me, but Matthew 16 is where you'll find our text. And uh, let me just mention a couple of things to you before we jump in. Number one, we started about three months ago, the first part of June, and just kind of had a challenge that we wanted to do a, a bunch of reading in God's Word this summer, knowing our series and, and how it was going to cover the story from beginning to end. Uh, I challenged you to join me on a 90-day Bible reading challenge. We started the first part of June. We are just about done. If you have stuck with this, with me, then you are just a week away from reading all of God's Word beginning to end in 90 days. That's pretty awesome. And I want you to know I'm proud of you, and I'm proud of those who made that commitment and were able to keep at it and keep going. I know that God has blessed if you were able to, to do that. And so uh, look forward to finishing that up this week. And then I want to mention to you that in two weeks, not this Wednesday, as Paul talked about earlier, we're going to kick back off our Wednesday night stuff, but for adults, just fellowship time. But the following Wednesday, uh, we will be starting a new Bible study on Wednesday nights. It is going to be based on the TV series called The Chosen which is based on the life of Jesus. I don't know if you've heard of this. If you've heard of it you, and have seen it, then you know this is very, very different from anything you've probably seen uh, before. And if you haven't heard of it, let me just tell you, it's, it's gonna be really, really fun for us to work through this series together. And so we will start that in two Wednesday nights. Uh, come on and be here, 5.30 dinner, six o'clock for study. Kids, youth, everybody studying and, and uh, being a part of Wednesday nights. It'll be good to be back together. Amen? Amen. All right. We are in week eight of our summer series called Thread, which I mentioned earlier. And over these past several months, we've seen how God's plan for redemption has unfolded through all of these different stories, these different people throughout Scripture. Adam, if you remember, Abraham. Moses, David, and Zedekiah. And then last week, over the last two weeks, we talked about Jesus, the culmination of the redemption story, who came as the payment for all of our sins. Now, with two weeks left, that brings us to one of the most important and I think surprising characters in all of the Bible. Are you ready? You and me. That's right. Believe it or not, God has written us, you and me, into the story of redemption. You, you say to yourself, well, no, wait a minute. That, that's not right. I don't see my name anywhere in there unless I happen to have a Bible character name. My story's not in, in the Bible. Oh, but it is. It's 100% in the Bible, and we're going to talk about it and learn about it this morning. You see, God has taken our lives and our stories and who we are and what we're to do, and he has included it in the thread of redemption. And the exciting thing about today is we get to find out about our part of the story and what it looks like 
as we move forward in history. So I want you to fill in your name at the top of your notes. If you're a note-taking person, some of you are very passionate about it. Others of you probably don't care. That's fine either way. But if you're a note-taker, you see that blank there that says your name, I want you to write your name in there. And then I want everybody to say, even if you're not a note taker, I want everybody to say their own name with me on the count of three, just so we get a sense of who all this story is about. Okay, you're going to say your first name. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three, Justin. And some of us are a little more passionate than others, and that's good. I like that. Let's try it again. One more time. I want to hear everybody's name. One, two, three, Justin. All right, very good, very good. And so that's actually the Bible study or the character that we're going to study today. All of those names that you just heard. Now, do you guys know what this is? Let's see if we have this. Yep, that's it. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, it's a buzzer, okay? It's a pager, almost. This is one of those things you get... Uh, in a restaurant when you have to wait. You know what I'm talking about? You show up, you give them your name, they're like, yeah, it'll be like 30 minutes, and they hand you this, this little buzzer thing. And, and let me just ask you, uh, do we all agree? This is horrible, right? Those things are horrible. And this will tell you something about my personality. By the time I've held that thing for a few minutes and it hasn't buzzed, I'm convinced that it's broken, right? I mean, I'm just like, well, this one doesn't work. And... And I know I'm not the only one who thinks that, but you wait and you wait and you wait, and sometimes people will come in after you and get seated ahead of you, and you think, wait a minute, you know, this, this can't be right. Can anybody relate to that besides me? I, I, I just recently, was, was, we were on vacation, and I was having to wait too long to get in, and I went up to the, the person, the hostess, and, and I said, you know, this thing is messed up. Something's wrong with it. They're like, no, sir, you're 27th in line. I'm like, but... That's not possible. I've been here for 30 minutes. She said, oh, you're right. Hang on. You're 31st in line. Yes, you're, you're right. That wasn't, that wasn't correct. I don't know about you, but waiting can be very, very frustrating. You know why? Because we all hate to wait, don't we? We all hate to wait, and yet in our lives we are forced to wait in all sorts of environments, we wait in lines where we stand behind someone and others stand behind us. We wait, as I mentioned, in restaurants. We wait in literal waiting rooms. We spend a lot of our life waiting. Would you agree with that? And none of us enjoy waiting. Well, when, when we come to this particular chapter... In the story of redemption, a great deal of what we're going to be talking about hinges on waiting. In fact, the term that, that we're going to identify with our part of the story, we've had one word that we've kind of identified with each character in the thread of redemption. The word that we're going to use for us, for Justin, or for your name, is the word patience. And, and kind of the motion that we're using here is kind of the pump the brakes, slow down, right? Patience. Have you ever had a thought along these lines? God, why don't you just go ahead and change things? Or God, why don't you just go ahead and heal me or this person that I care about? Or God, why don't you just go ahead and come back? In other words, what are you waiting for, God? Right? What are you waiting for, God? In other words, why is it taking you so long? Now, the good news is that we're not the first group of Christians to be frustrated by that. When Jesus was on this earth, after he had died on the cross, after he had risen from the dead, he gathers his disciples together for a conversation. And they say to him exactly what you or I would want to say to him. Look, Jesus, we know our Old Testament history. Okay, we know the promise that you made to Father Abraham. We know about the powerful kingdom that you built under David. And we know about the promise you made to restore that kingdom someday. And then you came, 
And we believe, we believe that you are the Messiah. So as best as we can tell, as best as we can understand the Old Testament, everything has happened that needs to happen for this nation to be restored and for Israel to come back to power. So is this it? Is this it? Now, you would agree with me, pretty logical question, yes? I mean, that's a fair question to ask. He died on the cross, he rose from the grave, they're standing there with the king, it's time for a kingdom, right? But Jesus says, no, no. There's actually something else that has to happen first. And the disciples, God love them, they were completely confused. Well, what could possibly be next? And do you know what Jesus reveals to them in that moment? Are you ready for this? He reveals to them us. He reveals to them you and me. He announces to the disciples in that moment, the next chapter in the story of redemption, he reveals you and he reveals me. Now, the disciples thought they were the final chapter. Okay, that's what they had in mind when they followed Jesus. But there was one chapter they had overlooked, one they didn't really even know about. And it's understandable that they didn't know about it because there's nothing actually in the Old Testament that even alluded to it. Here's how it happened. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In other words, people have all kinds of opinions about who you are, Jesus. You you may be some, you know, Old Testament prophet come back to life, or, or maybe you're, you know, John the Baptist come back to life, but everybody's got a different opinion about who you are. Verse 15, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am. And Simon Peter answered, maybe in his best moment, he said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man. In other words, you didn't figure this out on your own, but by my father in heaven. Now listen to this in verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my, what's the word? Church. Church. At which point, and we don't know this, but I'm thinking the disciples looked at one another and said, I'm I'm sorry, your what? Your your church? (laughs) I mean, what is that about? We know family, we know nation, we know kingdom, but Church, that's the first we're hearing about this. And understand, the word church, that's a a German word, okay? The actual literal word that that Jesus used at that point, it, it it was not really a concept that they understood very well. It basically just meant a gathering or an assembly. And we don't know, but I imagine the disciples looked at one another, maybe with panic, and said, no, 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 not church, that's not right, not gathering, kingdom, kingdom, we're ready for a kingdom, you're the king, we're going to have, say it with me, a kingdom, come on, Jesus, right, work with me here, but Jesus is so contrarian, would you agree with that? He's like, no, no, that's not right. He says, there's another chapter. He says, there is something else that is gonna blow your mind. It's still to come. He says, I'm gonna build something. I'm gonna build my capital C church. And 2,000 years later, here we are. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. Part of the story, a prophecy of Jesus fulfilled in us. 
And then look at how he finishes the sentence, verse 18. He says, I will build my church, my gathering, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That is, no matter what kind of opposition arises, no matter what kind of obstacles get in the way, I'm telling you guys, nothing will stop what I am about to initiate in this world. And he was exactly right, wasn't he? I mean, here we are, all these years later, gathering together as the church today in this community, in our city, in this state, in this nation, and literally all over the world, millions upon millions of people are worshiping Jesus today. And think about the obstacles thrown in the way of the church over these 2,000 years, and yet the church continues to thrive and it continues to multiply. Think about it, Rome tried to stamp it out. What happened to Rome? Rome became a hub of Christian activity. Do you realize that? The Chinese tried to stamp it out in 1954. They threw out all the missionaries. No missionaries allowed in this country. And when the missionaries went back in decades later, they found the church stronger than it had ever been before. Are you old enough to remember that the Soviet Union tried to get rid of the church? Listen, the church outlasted the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union no longer exists, but Christianity is still going strong. Think about that. The church has survived poverty and prosperity. It survived scandal and immorality. It survived technology, a worldwide pandemic, Hey, it's even survived boring preaching, amen? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, think about it. Nations have literally come and gone. Kings and kingdoms have come and gone. It all comes and it all goes and the Lord Jesus Christ and his church still marches on because Jesus said, I will establish my church and there is nothing anybody can do about it. See, so you've been going to church on and off all your life, and you had no idea what you were really a part of. You've been involved in the fulfillment of a prophecy. You've been involved in a chapter in the story of redemption. And don't miss this. That is just as significant as what happened to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to the nation of Israel, it is as important as what happened the day an angel came to Mary and said, hey, guess what? A Messiah is on the way. We are a part of the story. Isn't that awesome? Hey, do you know what's unique? You know what is different about the church? Jesus said something later on, the apostle Paul kind of fleshed this out for us. He said that the thing that's gonna be different about the church. It's not gonna be like a family or a nation or a kingdom. He said, the church is actually going to be my body. You remember that? The body of Jesus Christ. It's not simply about a bunch of individuals running around representing Jesus. I mean, that's great and we are that, but we're more than that. There, there's some kind of thing that, that happens when the members of the church, when those who have put their faith in Christ come together and function as they've been gifted to function. There's just this thing that happens that takes place. In fact, I, I'll tell you where we see this all the time. People over the years have come through our church and they look around and it's not what they expect. And they watch the other people and they listen to the teaching and they participate in the worship. They observe the relationships being developed right in front of their, their own eyes and they, they see how people treat one another. And listen, I'm not suggesting in any way that we're perfect or even close to it, okay? We're not, and I would never suggest that. But people walk out of here all the time and say, something is going on at OBC. And some of you have, have said that before. After your first experiences, something is going on. Do you know what that something is? It's the presence of Jesus Christ in his body. 
That's who we are. That's what's happening. That's what's taking place. And this is what Jesus predicted. I'm going to establish my church, and there is nothing in this world that is going to stop it. And think of it. We, you, have been invited to be a part of this current chapter of the story. And I just think that that is incredible. Now, the question is, what are we supposed to be doing as the body, as the church? Because see, if you lived in the day of, of Abraham, you kind of knew what you were supposed to do. God made it pretty clear. You had to be a part of Abraham's family. You want to be a part of what God's doing? You got to be a part of his family. In the days of Moses, to be a part of what God was doing, you just hung out with the Israelites. Egyptians, Red Sea, Ten Commandments, Promised Land, all that stuff. It was, it was pretty obvious. In the golden age of Israel, when David was king and God was blessing that nation as they committed themselves to keeping the law, you knew exactly what God wanted. You knew what he was up to. Even in the days of Zedekiah, when the prophet Jeremiah said, listen, Zedekiah, you've got to get your act together or God is going to send this nation into exile. You knew what God was up to when Jesus was walking this earth and he was doing miracles and he was teaching about the kingdom of God. Hey, if you wanted to be in on what God was up to, you knew where to go, right? You went into his presence. But what about now? What about right now? How do we get in on what God is doing now. Well, here's the good news. God is no less active in this age than he ever was in ages past. Why? Because we are a part of his story. The story continues. And on the day that he departed from this earth, Jesus pretty much told us what our responsibility was. Here's how he said it in Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the, what's the last word? of the age, to the very end of the age. Now, what's he talking about? This is important, because this is, this is about us. So we probably ought to know, we need to know what, what this means. He's saying that this, that we're in right now, everybody, are you locked in? This is just another chapter. This is another age. He's saying to the disciples, something new is about to begin, but it has bookends. It will begin, and someday it will end. And until I return, and during this age of the church, even though you guys don't understand it, you are, about to, to, you are to be about bringing people into my kingdom. You're to be about building up this foundation that I am the Savior, that I am the son of God. And during that time, listen to this, to the degree that you are locked into my agenda, to the degree that you take seriously my command to tell others about me, to that degree, I will be with you all the way to the end of the age. That's right. Do you know why it is that you've been to churches? And, and this is not to, to cast aspersion, it's just a reality. Do you know why you've been to churches that were just so dead? You wondered why they didn't just sell the building and give the money away? Don't pretend like you never thought that, okay? When you had to go to Aunt Selma on Easter. You know why some places feel like that? Because they're no longer doing what God left them there to do. So why would he need to show up? Listen. Listen. We don't ever want to be that church. Amen? Amen? We don't ever, ever want to be that church. If you've been a Christian for a long time, and, and you're at a place where you'd say, you know, my relationship with God is it's just kind of flat. I'm just, I don't know if I'm getting that much out of it. I'll tell you why. In all likelihood, it's because you're not doing what God left you here to do. So why should God show up in your life? You see, it's, it's the small group. It's the handful. 
doesn't matter the size. It's the men and the women who come together to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. That is where God shows up. And if you think about it, that's where he showed up in the days of Abraham, the days of Moses, the days of David, the days of Zedekiah, and the days of Jesus. God showed up to do the thing that he left his people here to do. And if you want to get in on what God is up to in this generation, in this age, then you have to embrace this commission that God has given to us, that, that Jesus gave to us that day, that he established the church and he sent the Holy Spirit to empower us and to bring people into his kingdom. And if you don't, you miss your opportunity to be a part of the story. Now, what does that look like? Well, you know something? If you've read the whole New Testament, basically here's what you find. You find that as a Christian, as the body of Christ, God has called us to pursue three really important relationships. And here's where you can write some more stuff down if you're inclined to. But I want you to really hear these three Things. Number one is intimacy with God. We are left here to pursue intimacy with our Heavenly Father. My prayer life, my devotional life, that's part, that part of me that says, God, I'm so frustrated. Give me the grace and the peace and the mercy and, and grow me up to be a better representative of you. That is that intimacy with God that we're supposed to be pursuing in this age in this generation. Secondly, we're to be pursuing community with other Christians. That's why we're here today, because we're not called to be Lone Ranger representatives. We've been called to work together in, in such a way as to be the body of Christ, which means it's my responsibility and it's your responsibility to learn how to work at healthy relationships with other believers so that we can be the church. Because I'm telling you, there is no greater evangelistic tool, there is, there is no better environment for unbelievers to become believers than a place where they can see Christians simply being what Christians are supposed to be, okay? And by the way, the opposite is also true, but the worst tool, the worst weapon against unbelievers is to see Christians not relating the way that they're supposed to relate. Some of you have been through that in your life, and you've been tripped up by that. So we're to pursue intimacy with God. We're to pursue community with other Christians. And then the third thing that you see throughout the New Testament is that we are to pursue influence with non-believers. That is something that is to be actively happening in our life. We are to be leveraging our relationships with people outside the church in such a way as to lead them towards a relationship with God. Now, why would we do that? Because that's what God is waiting on. And we get to be a part of it. Now, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, what I just said may kind of bother you. Because you're going, well, you know what? Why don't you just leave me alone? Okay, I'm not religious and I don't even want to be. I've got my own set of beliefs and I think it's all gonna work out one day, so why do you feel the need to keep bothering me? Well, here's why, and I, and I need you to hear this. It's because we really believe all of this. Okay, that's why. That's why we keep bothering you. That's why we keep inviting you. That's why we keep trying to serve you. That's why we keep encouraging you, because we actually really believe that there's a heaven and a hell and that people go to one of those places forever. And I want you to think about this. What kind of people would we be if we didn't bother you? What would that say about us? Because we think your house is on fire. And we're knocking at your door trying to get your attention. We're trying to get you out, not because we're in any way better than you or smarter than you, but because we honestly care about you. And the truth is if, is that bothers you for me to say that your house is on fire, and I recognize it, I get it. You're like, hey, don't talk to me. Don't tell me my house is on fire. The truth is every single one of us in this room who are believers at some point in our lives were living in a burning house. Yes, 
Every one of us, okay? And somewhere, someone cared enough about us to show us how to escape that burning house. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be here today. But by the grace of God, we are here. And as the body, here's what we're to be about. Intimacy with God, with our Heavenly Father. Community with other believers. And influence with non-believers. So, let me ask you this question. As a Christian, as you think about those three things, of those three things, and they're on the screen behind me, which one or two do you need to ratchet up just a little bit? What's your intimate, one-on-one, personal relationship with God like these days? Have you lost some of your joy? Are you experiencing a little less excitement? You know what? You need to get back in the game. You got to get back in the game. You know why? Not just for your sake, for our sake, for the kingdom's sake, for the opportunity you have to be a part of what God is up to in this age. How about your relationship with other believers? Are you one of those people who has the mindset, you know what, I can worship alone. I don't really need anybody else. Me and God are a majority. That's awesome. You know what, that's not in the Bible. Okay, do you realize that? That may be your personality, and I'm not discounting that. That may be your comfort level, and I'm not discounting that, but that's not in the Bible. Come on. This community of believers, we need you and we need your gifts for us to be what God has called us to be. You need to invest in relationships with other Christians. You need to get in community. And and let me me just say this real fast. Community does not happen right here at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. It doesn't. Okay, this is worship. This is study. This is, you know, maybe five minutes of, of coffee and small talk and that's awesome but it's not community and you got to go a little deeper than that but show up next Sunday morning at 9 45 and let's get together in a classroom and open God's word and, and study together on an intimate level let's get to know one another and what our problems and our struggles and our triumphs are let's show up on Wednesday night And let's spend time together again in God's word relating to one another getting to know one another Sharing burdens with one another. That is how we grow community. How about your relationships with other with with unbelievers? Christian, who are you concerned about right now? Who are you burdened for? Who do you pray for? Are the people around you at work just a means to a financial end? Or is there somebody there that just breaks your heart because of what's going on in their life and you desire for them to come to faith in Christ? You got to get in the game. This is what God is waiting for, okay? This is what this age is all about. So here's my challenge to you. If you're a member or a participant in this church, here's my challenge. Are you ready for it? Let's be the church. Amen? Amen. I love it. Let's be the church. Let's be what God has called us to be. Listen, it's going to happen with or without us. Let's don't miss the opportunity to be what God has called us to be and to accomplish what God has given us, the unique opportunity in this generation, in this age, to be able to accomplish. And listen, I get impatient just like you do. But the Bible says we're to wait. We're to wait patiently and yet we're to wait proactively. And while we wait, we're to make disciples. We're to pursue intimacy with God. We're to pursue community with other Christians. And we're to leverage influence with unbelievers. Knowing that one day this age is going to come to an end. And we will stand before our Father in heaven and we will give an account. And I hope that on that day, every single one of us can say, thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for allowing me to be a small part of what you have done since the beginning of time throughout the story 
of redemption. Heavenly Father, God, we pray that we are being the church that you have called us to be. God, you left us here for a reason and a purpose. We're not here by accident. We're not here just to to take up air and space. God, we are here because you left us here on purpose. And you told us what we are to do. We are to develop and to deepen our intimacy and our relationship with you. We are to pursue community and deeper relationships with other Christians. And we are to, to pursue influence with those who don't yet know you, who are hurting, who are lost, who are struggling, who may have a big smile on their face, but on the inside, they're struggling to find any hope. God, will you, will you not only equip us to be the church you've called us to be, God, will you show us what that looks like in this community, in the community where we live, in our family, in our neighborhood, in our school, in our job, wherever we are, God. You left us here for a reason. God, will you help us to pursue what you have called us to pursue? I want you to take just one moment now. And I want you to consider, Christian, where you're at in terms of your intimacy with God. in terms of your community with other Christians, in terms of your influence with non-believers? Which area or which area needs to be improved upon? Speak to your Heavenly Father about that. Ask Him to show you and make a commitment to Him. Father, be at work in our hearts as we start a new school year, as we see new opportunities ahead of us. God, may we be the church you have called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, let's stand together. And as Jamie leads us, let's worship by being responsive in our heart and in our mind to our Heavenly Father. Paul and I will be here at the front. If you need somebody to pray with you, or maybe there's something on your mind, on your heart that you need to share or a question you need to ask, you can do that during this time. Jamie's going to lead us, and then in a few minutes, our youth pastor Marwin's going to come and close this out. As Jamie leads, let's be obedient to him. church how are you guys doing we're good we're good oh man y'all all all asleep right uh no i just want to say uh i want y'all to just hear what justin had challenged us with right it's a challenge as a church right to be intimate with god 
We all humans, we're all broken, right? And we have hard times in our life, but really strive to be intimate with God. And this community right here, let's not take it for granted, amen? Uh, and then as well, let's reach to the people that once, like Justin said, we were those people, right? right? That That's someone true. came in your life and told you about the good news. So let's right. do that, Amen. right? Let's pray for us and you'll be dismissed. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for each and every face in this room. Lord, as today we celebrated and had a promotion Sunday with sixth graders coming into the youth, it was just awesome to see young faces come into a group that they know they can reach out to, that's a family, right? That community group, Lord, just thank you for them. Lord, I pray that today we're challenged to influence people, to grow closer to you, God. Let us do that. Let us take every opportunity we have this week, this month, this year. Thank you, in your son's name, amen. You're dismissed.